in the last 18 lectures we have discussed the basics of semiconductors. We considered the equilibrium carrier concentration, then we considered excess carriers. We saw how the carriers move in response to electric field and concentration gradients. Then we saw how we can translate all this basic understanding into five differential equations which describe the movement of carriers in any physical situation in semiconductors. These five equations were the two transport equations for electrons and holes, the two continuity equations one for electron and one for hole and then the Gauss's law. We showed with an example how starting from these five basic equations we can analyze any physical situation. Important in this analysis is the set of approximations which are based on the physical understanding. Now we are ready to consider the various semiconductor devices one after the other such as the diode, the bipolar junction transistor, the field effect transistor and so on. So we will begin our discussion with the basic device namely the PN junction. Now what are we going to do in the lectures on PN junction? We will mention our objectives by showing a set of characteristics which we will try to explain and for which we will try to derive mathematical equations. The first characteristic of interest would be the forward characteristics. This particular diagram shows the experimental forward characteristics of a PN diode. The circuit using which these characteristics are measured is shown here. Everyone is familiar with the diode symbol. This arrow indicates the P region and the vertical line here that indicates the N region. The forward bias means the P region is positive with respect to the N region. Under these conditions the characteristics which result are shown here. It will be of interest to see the order of the currents. The currents are of the order of milliamperes. This is a small signal diode that we are considering and the voltages are less than a volt. The important thing to see in these characteristics is that beyond about 0.6 volts the current seems to rise very steeply. This voltage beyond which the current rises steeply is normally referred to as the cut in voltage. So we need to explain the physical phenomena which result in these kind of characteristics where the current rises steeply beyond a certain voltage. Now it is also important to note that the temperature should be mentioned whenever we discuss characteristics of any semiconductor device. This is because the characteristics are very very sensitive to temperature. To understand what kind of behavior this current voltage characteristics indicate it is useful to see the same set of characteristics on a slightly different scale where the current is plotted on a log scale rather than a linear scale. Now that is a diagram showing the current on a log scale as a function of the voltage. Notice that 0.6 volts is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.8 here. Okay. So we find that at 0.6 volts for the silicon diode the current versus voltage seems to be an exponential behavior. Okay. The, that is the current is varying as exponential of Vf by Vt that is what is shown by this dotted line here. However, for lower voltages where the current was low on a linear scale the behavior seems to be exponential but in the exponent the, there is a factor half coming in that is the current varies as exponential of Vf by 2 times Vt. Now exactly a similar behavior can be seen for the gallium arsenide 
diode also. Let us look at the diagram. This black curve here is for the gallium arsenide diode. At low currents, the gallium arsenide diode also shows the current varying as exponential of V f by 2 times V t. Whereas, at higher voltages, the current becomes exponential V f by V t. Now, another thing to see is that at voltages even higher, the current is again deviating from the exponential behavior for both silicon as well as the gallium arsenide devices. Now, this is the range where actually if you plot the current voltage characteristics in the linear scale that is current on the linear scale as a function of voltage on the linear scale, okay, then you will find the current voltage characteristics to be linear. So, this is the range on the diagram where the current voltage characteristics are linear. So, we need to explain why these kind of variations. Okay. The advantage of plotting on the log scale is that whenever you get straight line portions on a log of current versus linear voltage scale, you know that this implies that the current is varying exponentially with voltage. So, the exponential nature of the current voltage characteristics is very clearly shown by this log current versus voltage plot. Another thing to see here important is that for gallium arsenide diodes, the cut in voltage is higher. Okay, you can see that for the same current, the voltage in the gallium arsenide diode is higher by about 0 0.2 volts. So, we need to explain this particular aspect. Which parameter of the semiconductor is responsible for deciding the cut in voltage? Okay, as we will see, it will be the energy gap of the semiconductor. Now, let us move further. We will next see the reverse current voltage characteristics. Here are the reverse current voltage characteristics of a silicon diode, which have a low breakdown voltage. So, you know that a diode is a rectifying device. So, it must not pass any current in the reverse bias. So, the reverse bias arrangement uh, is shown here, the circuit in which these characteristics are measured. V r is the magnitude of the reverse bias and I r is the magnitude of the reverse current. So, the reverse current flows from the n region to the p region. Okay? This is the direction of the reverse current. Now, when the diode breakdown voltage is of the order of about 3 volts, then you find this kind of reverse characteristics. That is, the current starts increasing gradually beyond the breakdown point okay, and then the rise becomes steep. So, whenever the breakdown voltage is low, there is a particular mechanism that is responsible for the breakdown voltage. And this mechanism is called the Zener mechanism. So, that is why on this graph you will see that these characteristics are referred to as Zener breakdown. An important thing to note here in this diagram is that as your temperature increases from minus 76 to 80 degree centigrade, the breakdown voltage is reducing. Okay. Which is the breakdown voltage here? Well, it is difficult to locate exact value of the breakdown voltage because the characteristics are not increasing steeply beyond a particular point. Okay? So, this is a rather gradual increase that is why these are called soft breakdown characteristics. So, you can locate the breakdown by for example, extending this line from here, you could extend it down and then take this intercept that is one way of locating the breakdown voltage. Another way of locating the breakdown voltage will be to refer to the voltage corresponding to a particular current. So, for example, you could take a current of about 1 milliampere and try to see what the voltage is and you can call that as the breakdown voltage. So, Zener breakdown characteristics are soft that is the current increases gradually and in these characteristics 
as your temperature increases the breakdown voltage reduces this is one thing that we would like to explain. Now let us see another type of breakdown characteristics in the reverse direction and that is the avalanche breakdown. Normally this kind of character characteristics are seen when the device has a high breakdown voltage. Now what is it that decides the breakdown voltage as we will see the breakdown voltage is decided by the doping in the p-n junction. Now what is important here is to see that these characteristics are rather sharp that is the current is seen to rise very rapidly beyond a certain point that we can call as a breakdown point. So the breakdown voltage on avalanche breakdown characteristics can be located very easily okay, and precisely. As against uh, the Zener breakdown voltage, the, as you can see from here for the avalanche breakdown voltage as the temperature increases, the breakdown voltage increases. Okay. So 20 degree centigrade this is the breakdown whereas for 120 degree centigrade the breakdown is higher. So we will try to explain why for avalanche breakdown mechanism the breakdown voltage increases with temperature. We can see this part of the curve and which shows that as your temperature increases the reverse current increases. Okay. So this is another thing that we would like to explain the increase in the reverse current with temperature. In fact a rather rapid increase in the reverse current. You can see that for from 20 degree centigrade to 120 degree centigrade the increase in reverse current is more than about uh, 3 orders of magnitude. Okay. So this is about 10 power minus 7 here and uh, this is 10 power minus 9. So it is about 2 orders of magnitude not more than 3 orders about 2 orders of magnitude for 100 degree centigrade change in temperature. This is also something that we would like to explain. Let us see next what we will do. After considering the DC characteristics namely the forward current voltage characteristics, the reverse current characteristics below breakdown and the breakdown voltage of the diode, we will go to the AC characteristics or small signal characteristics. Now this is a circuit using which the small signal characteristics are measured. It is necessary to emphasize here that there is a DC bias. The small signal characteristics are measured in the presence of a DC current and voltage. This is very important to understand. So we should not be under the impression that small signal characteristics are measured by applying an AC voltage to the diode alone. Okay. It is not the AC voltage alone but rather a DC voltage over and above which an AC voltage is superimposed and this AC voltage is very small. So what is the order of this voltage? The circuit that we are going to develop, uh, the uh, characteristics that we are going to decide uh, or rather the characteristics that we are going to study will correspond to the applied voltage magnitude much less than the thermal voltage. Okay. So the AC voltage that is applied is Vm sin omega t this is the AC voltage wherein the amplitude Vm is much less than the thermal voltage Vt. So that is meaning of the small signal characteristics. Okay. The voltage is as small as that. Now what will happen is that we will see that the current would be given by the small signal current which is present in the circuit in response to the small signal voltage. That would be given by Im sin omega t plus theta. So there is a phase difference between the voltage and the current. We will try to find out what is the magnitude of the cur current as a function of the magnitude of the voltage and also what is the magnitude of the phase and how this depends on the frequency of the applied voltage. 
the applied AC voltage. So your applied voltage is VA, a DC voltage plus a small AC voltage and the resulting current is shown here as a DC current I plus a small AC current I. Now this behavior is often represented in terms of an equivalent circuit. So we could either give mathematical equations for I m in terms of V m and theta in terms of the frequency omega or equivalently we can find out the values of the small signal resistance R and the capacitance C in parallel okay, which will represent the diode. So any such behavior of an AC current in response to an AC voltage can be represented also by an equivalent circuit. Okay. So this is the equivalent circuit concept. Notice that the resistance R and the capacitance C are in parallel. We will try to explain why the resistance and capacitance should be regarded as parallel for this diode. And we will try to find out the values of small r and small c which in turn depend on the phase theta and the magnitude I m of the current in response to the voltage V m and the frequency omega. Next, our effort will be to study the capacitance voltage characteristics in reverse bias. So we have seen the small signal equivalent circuit of a diode consists of a resistance R in parallel with capacitance C. This equivalent circuit is valid for both forward and reverse bias. But in reverse bias, as we shall see the resistance R is very large and the diode is almost like a capacitor. And there are a lot of applications of a diode under reverse bias where the capacitance of the diode is of interest. So what is the behavior of this capacitance? So CV characteristics of a reverse biased abrupt junction. We will see what is meant by an abrupt junction when we discuss the issue of uh, the topic of junctions in detail. Right now all that we need to emphasize here is the variation of the capacitance as a function of reverse bias that is shown in this graph here. So what you find is if you plot the reverse bias small signal capacitance of the diode squared, okay. so 1 by C j square, the j here stands for the junction. If you plot 1 by C square versus the reverse voltage, notice here that the voltage is negative. Okay. This is because what is shown here is not only the magnitude of the bias but also the polarity of the bias. So reverse bias means a negative voltage, forward bias is positive that is the reference. So 1 by C square versus V is a straight line that is what is seen here. This is what we will try to explain, we will derive a mathematical relation which will explain this particular behavior. Now having seen the various characteristics that we are going to explain namely the DC current voltage characteristics and the small signal characteristics. We will now list the various topics that we will need to cover to derive these characteristics. Now these topics are first we will uh, consider the device structure and how the device is fabricated. This discussion will be brief but this is important to begin with. Then we will consider the equilibrium picture of the PN junction. When no applied voltage is present, how does the PN junction behave? Our aim in this analysis will be to show the spatial distributions of the N, P, J, N, J, P and E that is the electron and hole concentrations, the electron and hole current densities and the electric field. This is very much on the same line as that in the solved example which was considered in the procedure for device analysis topic. Next we will consider the spatial variation of energy bands under equilibrium. After that 
we will derive the ideal current voltage characteristics for forward and reverse bias. So, we will define an ideal PN junction. Obviously, lot of simplifications will be involved, but the result of this will be the exponential current voltage characteristics. So, these characteristics will be obtained using the spatial distributions of N, P, J, N, J, P and E and after this discussion, we will also show the variation of the energy bands under applied bias. Now, one point I want to emphasize here is that the analysis of the PN junction can be done with or without the aid of a energy band diagram. So, although we find in books energy band diagrams will being referred to frequently, it will be useful to see exactly what is the advantage gained using an energy band diagram for PN junction analysis. So, most of the analysis can be done without the aid of energy band diagram, but there are some advantages in using the energy band diagram that is you can get some additional and involved details using the energy band diagram. So, we will clearly show this. So, we will do the analysis without the energy band diagram and then we will discuss the energy band diagram. After that, we will explain the non-idealities which are present in the real IV characteristics how the real IV characteristics differ from the ideal characteristics. More specifically, we will explain the ideality factor, then the series resistance effect, then the depletion layer generation current and then the breakdown. So, ideal current voltage characteristics do not explain breakdown. Okay. Next, finally, we will consider the small signal characteristics wherein we will derive expressions for the resistance and capacitance under forward and reverse bias. So, let us begin with the device structure and fabrication. Here is a diode that you would have used in your laboratory experiments related to circuits. This is a package device that is it contains the silicon PN junction encapsulated so that leads are available for soldering to other components in the circuit. Let us look at the components of this particular device. This is called an axial lead glass packaged diode. So, this has two leads here. Between these two leads, a silicon chip is present and this whole assembly is put in a glass tube which is shown here. Now, let us consider the parts of this packaged diode in detail. That is what is shown here. These are the two metal leads between which the silicon chip is held and the leads make contact to the P and N regions which are on top and the bottom. And this entire assembly is held or encapsulated in a glass tube. By raising the temperature of this assembly to 600 degree centigrade, glass to metal sealing is ensured at this point, this point, this point and this point, where the metal and the glass are in contact. The sealed portions here, these appear red in color in the photograph that we showed just now. Let us look at the structure of the PN junction within the silicon chip in detail. This structure is what is shown here. This is the cross section of the silicon chip and this is the top view. You can see the top view of the silicon chip shows the area. This is about a millimeter square for this diode that has been shown. The area depends on the current rating of the diode. This is the cross section. Now, it is important to note that the cross section has not been shown to scale. This dimension is about 1 millimeter, whereas this dimension is close to 100 microns as you can see. So, this is one tenth of this. We have not shown the device to scale because we want to show the various parts clearly. So, what you find here is a P plus region or heavily doped boron region of thickness equal to 1 micron has been created through a window 
in a silicon dioxide layer. This is a planar diode structure that is a diode made using a planar process. The thickness of the silicon dioxide layer is about 0.5 microns. This heavily doped boron layer is created in an n type substrate. A part of the n type substrate that is here is lightly doped, its doping depends on the breakdown voltage of the device that is required. The thickness of this layer also depends on the breakdown voltage considerations. For example, for a diode of 30 volts breakdown, the doping of this layer would be about 10 power 16 per centimeter cube and the thickness would be about 7 micron. Now, a 7 micron thin silicon substrate cannot be handled very easily. So, from the handling point of view, that is a mechanical handling point of view, you need a thicker silicon chip. So, for this purpose, the actual thickness of the silicon piece has to be about 100 microns or little more than that. Here it is for example, 107. Now, if the entire region, silicon region, if it were lightly doped, okay, then it would present a high series resistance when the current is flowing between these two leads in the forward bias direction. So, to cut down the series resistance, what is done is the layer which is not necessary from the breakdown voltage consideration or from the breakdown voltage point of view is converted into a heavily doped region. So, here the doping would be more than 10 power 19 per centimeter cube. So, that is why this is an n plus layer. Now, this is a p n diode or p plus n diode. You can also have n plus p diode that is this layer would be n plus heavily doped phosphorus, this dope, uh, this layer would be boron. Uh, in this particular diode, this layer is boron and this is phosphorus. Generally, the n plus region is made using the doping namely antimony and in some cases arsenic. Then the metal leads to take metal leads out, you need metal contacts. So, these are the two metal contacts which are deposited on the silicon wafer. The top view of the chip looks something like this. So, what you notice is this is the electrode, metal electrode. So, this is the top view of this particular region. Now, it is important to note that the top view of the window okay, also would be something like this, but this would be smaller than the metal. So, the window may be somewhere here. The corners of the windows are normally rounded off to get the required uh, breakdown voltage, sharp corners reduce the breakdown voltage. So, to re remove the effect of sharp corners, generally these corners are rounded off. Now, in a planar process, hundreds of such devices are made simultaneously. So, let us look at the uh, fabrication steps in detail to understand how this is done. The device fabrication begins with a silicon piece called a wafer which looks something like this. This is a 4 inch diameter silicon wafer. The thickness of this wafer is 500 micrometer or half a millimeter. The thickness is decided by mechanical handling considerations. Nowadays, silicon wafers of much higher diameters are being used. Now, you can see the devices are made on this particular face that you are able, so you are seeing. This face is mirror like that is it is polished, it has mirror like finish. On the other hand, the back side of the silicon wafer is rough because we do not need a fine finish on this side. This silicon wafer is subjected to a number of process steps to make the diodes. 
we will now see these steps in detail. This is the cross section of the 4 inch diameter silicon wafer. This is N plus that is it is heavily doped, its resistivity is about 18 mega ohm centimeter. It is left as an exercise to you to convert this resistivity into doping. On this, a very controlled layer of N type doping that is phosphorus doping is grown by a process called epitaxy. So, the thickness of this layer and the doping level both are decided based on the breakdown voltage requirements of this device. For a 30 volt breakdown, this layer is about 7 microns thickness and its doping level is 10 power 16 per centimeter cube of this order. The epitaxy is a process which allows you to grow layers of very controlled thickness and doping level. After the growth of this n-type layer, a silicon dioxide layer is grown all over this wafer. And windows are etched into the silicon dioxide layer so as to create the P plus or heavily doped boron layers. So, windows will be etched like this in the silicon dioxide layer, this is silicon dioxide. And through these windows, boron will be diffused to create the PN junction. So, this is P plus. This process of creating windows in a layer is called lithography. This is a very critical process in the planar process used for fabricating various devices in modern times. So, I will be discussing this process of lithography in somewhat detail. This is the silicon wafer with the silicon dioxide layer grown on it. The first step in lithography is to grow or deposit a layer of photosensitive material called photoresist. This particular wafer with the photoresist material is next exposed to light passed through what is called a mask plate. This mask plate is actually a glass plate on which a black colored emulsion is present in selected areas where you want to create the junctions. This black or dark areas prevent the light from passing through the plate and falling on the photoresist. So, when light is passed through this mask plate on this photoresist coated layer, these regions between the dark areas will be exposed to light and the light will cause a chemical reaction in this photosensitive material or photoresist and harden these areas. So, these areas get hardened because of exposure to light. Next what is done is that this exposed silicon wafer is dipped into a chemical which removes this areas where light had not fallen due to a chemical reaction. So, the chemical solution 
will dissolve these unexposed photoresist portions. So, this is how windows are created in this photoresist layer using this mask plate. I will show you how a real mask plate looks like. This is a mask plate, it is a transparent uh, glass slab and you find dark patterns in selected areas. Coming back to our discussion of the lithography process, this silicon wafer containing a photoresist layer etched in selected areas is dipped into a chemical solution which can etch the silicon dioxide. A chemical that can etch silicon dioxide is hydrofluoric acid. So, when this wafer is dipped in hydrofluoric acid, this photoresist regions prevent the acid from attacking the silicon dioxide beneath. As a result, the silicon dioxide will be etched only in these areas where there is no photoresist. So, this is how the windows created in the photoresist layer have been transferred onto the silicon dioxide layer. So, the photoresist uh, has played its role and it is like a sacrificial layer, this layer will have to be now removed. So, this is done by again subjecting this silicon wafer to a chemical solution that can remove the photoresist. So, at the end of the lithography process now, you have a silicon dioxide layer with windows in it. Okay? So, this is a silicon wafer through which now you can do further processing that is like diffusion and so on. Let us see how a practical silicon wafer looks like at the end of oxidation and lithography steps. This is half a millimeter thick silicon wafer. Since it is being shown in open air conditions, you will find some dust particles sitting on the wafer. These particles are detrimental to processing. We had earlier mentioned that we must process the silicon wafers under ultra clean conditions. In the second lecture, we had shown a photograph of a room, a clean room where semiconductor processing goes on. You can see that the man is in a hood and the entire room, in the entire room the clean uh, conditions are maintained. You can also see the clean air benches in which the silicon wafer is being handled and processed. This photograph will also help you to appreciate how dust particles can destroy the devices. The green areas on this wafer show silicon dioxide portions. The light gray areas are silicon exposed through the windows in the silicon dioxide. So, each small gray area is a device p n junction. So, you can see that a dust particle sitting on the silicon wafer actually covers 
a single device or in some cases adjacent devices. So, the devices underneath the dust particles will not be processed properly and will be defective. Thus, a large number of dust particles means large number of defective devices. Let us now take a close up look at the silicon wafer. The mirror like finish of the surface over which the devices are made is evident. You can see the reflection of the pointer on the surface. These are devices of different sizes. These are devices of the same size, but which are bigger. This wafer is being used to study the effect of area on the device characteristics. That is why you have devices of different areas. This is how a wafer will look after oxidation and lithography. It is now ready for diffusion. Having considered the lithography process, let us return to our discussion of the device fabrication and see what further process steps are needed to get the PN junction. So, returning to this figure where we find P plus regions being created through the oxide windows. Now, notice here that the oxide prevents the boron from diffusing in these areas. So, the oxide is acting like a mask when you do the boron diffusion. So, that only selected areas the boron regions are created or the PN junctions are created. So, next step is to metallize this structure. So, what you do is you grow a metal layer all over and then by a process of lithography, you remove the metal layer in these areas. So, that finally, you end up getting a metal like this. only on the p n junction areas. Now, after the metallization on this side, you also have to create a metal layer on the back side as an electrode. Now, before you create the metal layer on the back side, what is done is this particular silicon layer which is quite thick which is about 500 microns is reduced in thickness. because a thick layer means a high series resistance when the current is flowing in this direction. We need a thick silicon layer to start with because whenever you are doing all the various process steps, you must be able to handle the wafer which is of 4 inch diameter. But after the process steps are almost completed except for the backside metallization, not much of handling is required. And so, now the layer can be thinned so that the series resistance is reduced. So, there is what is called a process of back grinding. Using which this layer is thinned from the back side. And at the end of this thinning, this layer would be only about 100 microns thick. After back grinding, a metal layer is deposited all over on this side. So, now the diode fabrication is almost complete except that all the diodes are joined together on the wafer. You can see that a large number of such diodes will be present on a 4 inch wafer. So, although only two diodes have been shown, please do not think that this 4 inch wafer contains only two diodes. It depends on the area of the diode. As we have said, the area of this diode is almost 1 millimeter square for the device that we considered. So, there will be thousands of such devices. Okay? So, this is only a schematic illustration of how devices are present on the side. So, final step is to separate this particular wafer into individual p n junctions. So, this is done by a process called 
dicing wherein you cut the wafers at these selected places. So, now you have each individual pn junction ok. So, this region is what is shown here. So, this is the single diode chip which is available for packaging. Now, this chip is being put in the package as shown in this diagram. So, this is the silicon chip and then you have the two leads and the whole thing being put in a glass tube and then sealed. So, that you have the final package device for use. Now, I must emphasize here that the axial lead glass package is not the only package that is used for encapsulating diodes or any of the devices. There are many other types of packages also which are available. I have chosen this package for illustration because you would have used diodes in this form of package in your laboratory experiments related to circuits. I would also like to state that in our institute we have developed a technology for fabricating these diodes. The critical thing in this technology is the growth of the metal layer over the silicon chip. The metal layer has to be grown using a special process and that is the process that we have developed. With this we come to the end of the discussion on structure and fabrication of the PN junction. Now, let us spend a few minutes on the structure that we will be using for the purpose of analysis. We will be using a simplified version of the real device structure in analysis to avoid complexities. Let us consider the simplifications involved. Now, here we see the silicon chip containing the PN junction along with the leads which form a part of the package. There will be a contact resistance between the lead and the metallization of the PN junction or the silicon chip here and as well as here. Now, we are going to neglect these contact resistances. In other words, we will avoid the effect of the contact between the lead and the chips. This is the first simplification that we will be doing. So, now let us look at the silicon chip itself. What are the simplifications that we are doing here? If you plot the lines of current flow in the device, let us assume that the device is forward biased. Then the lines of current flow from P to N region would look something like this. They would be vertical in the central portion of the device area, but along the edges they will be two dimensional. We would like to avoid the two dimensional areas. So, what we do is that we ignore these portions of the device. So, that we are now left with a one dimensional situation. So, now the current flow in the device is one dimensional. Another simplification that we do is we simply ignore this n plus region. So, this is removed and we assume that the contact is here. And further we will neglect any resistance associated with the contact between the metal and the semiconductor that is the resistance here and the resistance here. So, these resistances which are contact resistances will also be ignored and as a result what happens is therefore, we remove these metal regions also.
the resulting device therefore looks something like this this is a bigger picture a blown up picture of the same thing so this is the device that is being used for analysis here this width of the p region called wp and this width of the n region called wn we will be assuming that these two regions are sufficiently long what is the meaning of sufficiently long it means that wp is much greater than the minority carrier diffusion length in that region that is the diffusion length of electrons and wn is also much greater than the minority carrier diffusion length of holes in the n region when we do the analysis we will understand why this criterion is used that is the comparison between the physical length and the diffusion length is used to decide the length of the regions okay so long regions or sufficiently long p and n regions imply that these regions are longer than the minority carrier diffusion length in those regions further if you now plot the diffusion uh, the doping profile not the diffusion but the doping profile in this diode the real doping profile would be something like this it is to be noted that we are plotting the doping on a log scale so since we are plotting on a log scale we cannot show the opposite polarities of p and n regions we plot only the magnitude and the shape of the variation of the doping which is caused by diffusion looks something like this on a log scale so this is the location of the junction where the net doping is zero on a log scale this goes to minus infinity so this is the junction this is doping na p type doping and this is nd the n type doping so the actual doping is non uniform in the device but we will assume that the doping is uniform in either regions this means that your doping profile that will be assumed will be something like this so uniform doping in the p region as well as uniform doping in the n region now such an approximation is called step doping or abrupt junction approximation so our analysis will be based on an abrupt or step junction approximation so this summarizes the structure that will be used for the purpose of our analysis uniformly doped regions no contact resistances and length of the regions much greater than the minority carrier diffusion lengths in those regions now towards the end of the lecture let us explain in a very simple manner why rectification is achieved using a pn junction or why a pn junction has rectifying current voltage characteristics this can be easily understood with the help of a diagram here this is a forward bias pn junction this means that the n type region is negative and the p type region is positive now it is easy to understand that a negative contact will attract holes or positive charges on the other hand the positive contact will attract electrons towards it so negative charges now the holes are majority carriers in the p region so p region can readily supply the holes which are required by the negative contact and similarly the n type region has majority electrons and it can supply electrons very easily 
which are required by the positive contact. Therefore, this type of current flow is very easy in a PN junction. So, in a forward bias therefore, you get a large current. Look at the picture for reverse bias. Now, N type contact is positive and P type contact is negative. The positive contact attracts electrons, but these electrons are minority carriers in the P region. So, the P region really cannot supply a large number of electrons and similarly, the N region cannot supply holes which will be attracted to the negative contact because holes are minority carriers here. So, this current will be very small in the reverse direction. So, this explains why for a given voltage in the forward direction you have a large current whereas, in the reverse direction you have a very small current. So, that explains why you have characteristics like this. For any given voltage in the forward direction you have a large current, but if this same voltage is taken on the reverse side that is on this side you get a small current. So, that is a very simple explanation of the current voltage characteristics that is rectifying IV characteristics of the PN junction. We will begin the analysis of the PN junction in detail in the next class. Let us quickly summarize what we have done today. Today we have seen what are the current voltage characteristics of the PN junction that we are going to explain in all the lectures related to this topic. Then we saw in detail how a PN is fabricated, what is the real structure of the device. Then we saw what is the simplified structure that is used for analysis. And finally, we gave a very simple qualitative explanation for the rectifying nature of the current voltage characteristics of a PN junction.